started. Welcome, thank you for joining us for our program. My name is Helen Liu and I'm the Programming and Partnerships Manager at Cary Library. Before we begin, I'd like to take a moment to thank the Cary Library Foundation. Their support enables us to bring programs like tonight's event to you. I'd also like to thank the Peabody Institute of Danvers for partnering with us on this program. This program is also being presented in partnership with the Town of Lexington Sustainability and Lexington Climate Action Network, LexCan. This program is being recorded and will be posted to the library's YouTube channel. If you have any questions, please submit them to the Q&A or to the chat. Books by our authors are available for purchase through Porter Square Books. I will add the link to the chat. Copies are also available to borrow through the Minuteman Library Network. Now I'd like to introduce our guest. Amy Brady is the executive director of Orion Magazine and co-editor of The World As We Knew It, Dispatches from a Changing Climate. Brady has published widely on how the climate crisis continues to influence art and culture and has made appearances on the BBC, NPR, and PBS. She holds a PhD in literature and American studies and has won writing and research awards from the National Science Foundation, the Breadloaf Environmental Writers Conference, and the Library of Congress. Taja Eisen is the author of the essay collection, Some of My Best Friends, named the best book of the year by outlets including Electric Literature, The Globe and Mail, and CBC Books. She is the co-editor of the anthology, The World as We Knew It, Dispatches from a Changing Climate, and has also edited for Catapult and The Walrus. Her writing has appeared in The Atlantic, Time, Vulture, and elsewhere. She lives in Brooklyn. Welcome, Amy and Taja. Thank you for joining us. I'm now going to pass the mic to Taja, who will be moderating the event tonight. Thank you so much, Helen, and thank you all for being here to celebrate Amy Brady's fabulous book, Ice, From Mixed Drinks to Skating Rinks, A Cool History of a Hot Commodity. I'm very excited for this evening's conversation. Um, you just heard the same book title in both mine and Amy's uh, bios. It's because we co-edited that uh, anthology of personal essays about climate change together. Um, so we've had the pleasure of, you know, doing various events together, but this is the first time one of us has interviewed the other. So it is very special and I'm very glad to be here. Thank you, Amy, for asking me to be your conversation partner. Oh, Taja, thank you for doing this. This is so great and so much fun. Um, so to get us started, I wanted to ask you about a piece that you published recently in Electric Literature, which was a book list about um, the genre that ICE participates in, the genre of the microhistory. So books that are histories of very specific objects or materials like coal or like eyeliner or like the toilet. Um, I wanted to ask just first of all, what, what sparked your interest in the genre, both what draws you to it as a reader um, and as a writer? Oh, thank you for that question. So, you know, I, I've been a, a pretty curious, some people might say nerdy person, for most of my life. Um, I love learning about new things and about the history of, um, you know, of, of a nation, of the world, uh, of an object. And what I love about micro histories is that they provide new perspectives for understanding the past and by extension our present. So for example, with my book, Ice, um, you know, it's the book takes readers, you know, all over the country and throughout, you know, 200 years of history. But we are introduced to new aspects of history that, um, you know, readers may not have discovered in textbooks or in schools because we're looking at that history through the prism of ice. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's what I think micro histories do really, really well is they take that single object or that subject and they use it to show us new and exciting things about who we are and where we've come from. Yeah. And th this, I guess this is kind of a related question, but I, I mean, I know you're somebody who thinks very deeply about um, the different ways that we try to tell the story of the climate crisis. Um, so, I mean, just in terms of what you were saying about the micro history, what, what do you think it does especially well when it comes to telling the story of climate change specifically that, you know, maybe other, other forms um, are not as well equipped to do? Oh, well, th thank you. Also, just you're such you're such an amazing conversation partner, Taja. <laughs> <Thank you. laughs> um, yeah, well, you know, maybe to um, to answer that question, I'll say first that, you know, this is a my book is a history of 
uh, a cultural history of ice in America. So, you know, it starts 200 plus years ago with the dawn of the natural ice trade and then follows history up through the um, the uh, invention of mechanically made ice, the rise of the electric refrigerator um, and why today uh, you can buy, uh, and even though most people in America at least have ice makers or at least ice cube trays in their refrigerator, why many people are still putting down $200, $300, $800 dollars to get a fancy ice machine on their countertop, right? I mean, I have a couple on my Amazon wish list, I admit it. <laughs> <laughs> and so it kind of looks at that history and where the book uh, culminates is, you know, with this question that sparked uh, my interest in writing about ice to begin with, which is just what does it mean to seek out and consume ice in a world that is rapidly warming? And we're seeing, you know, more and more each year, the loss of ice on our planetary poles. And, you know, what I discovered is that, you know, the rise in refrigeration uh, technology and what we would collectively call the, the cooling industry. So refrigerators, um, uh, freezers, air conditioners, how those technologies are dramatically impacting the planet, right? And so, um, so by telling that particular story, you know, what I'm, I'm hoping readers take away from it is that, you know, that the climate crisis isn't an accident, <laughs> right? I mean, it certainly wasn't something we intended to create, but it is 100% the result of, of human activity and the cooling industry and the, you know, American psychology that was shaped because of it, you know, our desire to put ice in our water to keep our houses, you know, at 72 degrees year round, you know, that that desire is also contributing to this problem. And, you know, my, yeah, my hope is that it's, it just helps people to kind of connect the dots that our present condition um, is related to our past and all the tiny and big decisions that we made along the way. Yeah, the, the book does that so beautifully, like just really meticulously builds this case um, that covers so many different sectors of you know American life and culture from ice cream to cocktails to health treatment um to just like the temperature that we keep our houses and I guess I mean what what I was really struck by is how covering you know in covering this much material the book still has this wonderful lightness of touch um so I wanted to ask what your process was of kind of choosing how much of the history to cover and how to divide it up because it really does cover like a truly impressive um span of time and invention and innovation yeah well you know <laughs> at the end of the day I, what i had to accept is that you can't please everybody <laughs> And to this day, I still receive emails from readers almost weekly from saying, well, you know, you didn't talk about, you know, the, the carving of ice in such and such town in Idaho, where I grew up and my grandfather was in the ice industry. And it's like, well, I can't because, you know, if this book was going to be much longer, nobody would read it. <laughs> right. So I had to make some difficult decisions about what to include and then you know critically what what I what I couldn't include and so what I tried to do and I, I like to think that I did it well you know was to choose the most impactful moments you know in history the the biggest catalysts that had the biggest impact that created the most change in how uh, we live um, you know the you know, Frederick Tudor, for example, you know, the person who launched the American ice trade, I wanted to tell his story because the entire cultural history of ice in the United States either wouldn't exist or would look very, very differently if he hadn't, you know, developed the ice trade. Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, ice sports, for example, would look a lot different today if it weren't for Frank Zamboni, who, um, you know, figured out how to clean ice, you know, um, you know, uh, between, you know, hockey games and, um, you know, between, uh, you know, skating events so that the ice was usable for the next, the next round of, of athletes. Um, so that's, that's really, you know, what I did is I, I tried to choose the most impactful people, the most impactful moments in history. And, uh, you know, some of that decision making is subjective, you know, but, you know, at the same time, it's, 
you can also trace from any of the moments I include in my book to the rise of entire industries, yeah. you know, or entire ways of thinking and behaving um, in this country as a, as a culture, as a society. And so that's, that was kind of my gauge. And like, no, no shade to, you know, Uncle Frank or Uncle Joe who delivered ice in, you know, Idaho or my hometown of Kansas. Like, I wish I could include their stories too. Um, but they're, they're there in spirit and they're, and they're there in the collective because there's also a chapter dedicated entirely to, to the Iceman. <laughs> yeah. And, and I feel like responses like that kind of prove the point in the project of the book, which is truly like the inescapable universality of ice and the way it touches on so many of just so many aspects of our life. So when people write you sort of claiming their personal ice story, that's sort of, you know, that's proof that you accomplished what you set out to do. Well, thank you. I, I'd like to think that's true. Yeah. Um, I want to invite everybody listening just as we're talking, you know, as uh, uh, if questions occur to you over the course of the conversation, um, please feel free to drop them in the Q&A box or in the chat itself. Um, and uh, we can leave some time for audience questions at the end. Um, hmm. So the book is packed with truly fascinating facts. Um, there is there is something for everyone here. Um, and I wanted to share a detail that really stayed with me, um, which was from the chapter on cocktails about pre-ice drinking culture. And the fact, I was just kind of haunted by the fact that, you know, before ice transformed cocktail culture, people would just drink warm rum in a mug. <laughs> just... Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> I know. I mean, Taja, you and I have shared, um, you know, lots of stories over cocktails. <laughs> So, you know, I know you're a person who can appreciate um, a well-crafted drink. And so, yeah, you know, to to a person of my taste, perhaps to a person of your taste, it is a bit horrifying to think <laughs> of, you know, a mint julep served lukewarm or at room temperature. Yeah. But I mean, that is just the way of life. I mean, before electric refrigeration, before ice boxes, before ice delivery, um, you know, there, there was no way to cool a drink. And more to the point, there, there weren't a lot of methods for moving uh, various liquors and spirits um, away from the coast, right? So, you know, rum imported, you know, from the, the Caribbean, for example, would usually pretty much kind of, you know, land in those, you know, southern port towns and then not make it too far inland. Um, and so, you know, it really wasn't until the arrival of the ice trade and the, um, the, uh, the, uh, arrival of the, um, the railroads that allowed people to ship, um, you know, perishables and things like lager, things that need to be kept that are really cold temperature, uh, long distances. Mm -hmm. Um, and that, yeah, that, that changed everything, um, and yeah, I mean, especially, especially in those, those early port towns where ice first, first uh, landed in the South, in the South. And I, I feel like that, that kind of detail, you know, the sort of cinematic detail of warm rum in a mug, um, it exemplified something that I really love about the book, which is the voice. Um, it, you know, even though it covers um, even though it has this sort of incredible breadth of historical and scientific knowledge, um, it always feels playful and conversational, even as it educates. Um, and I guess, I mean, I wanted to ask you about the, um, development of that voice and also just your thoughts on the voice in which capital H history usually gets told. And, um, if you thought about that tradition at all while, um, writing ice. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. You know, as I said earlier, I'm a curious, nerdy person. I read a ton of history books, a ton of them. And, you know, about a third of them are really, really good. And, you know, even fewer, I would classify it as educational and entertaining. Right. Um, and a, a lot of that is because the purpose for many writers Right. And I do think this is actually changing some, but historically speaking, many writers who produce works of histories and even micro histories, like what I'm working on, the, the point is to convey knowledge. 
right? But what I found when I was writing this book is I was surprised constantly, right? The research, the stories that I was uncovering, I found them very surprising. I often found them very funny. Um, They helped me to see connections between different historical moments and people that I never knew existed. And I thought the one of the best ways that I can convey what I'm feeling, you know, to the readers is to try to imbue the language with that and, you know, to make, to illustrate those moments. Um, and uh, I'm just so pleased to hear that, you know, you think that that, that attempt to, you know, imbue that playfulness, that, um, that element of surprise and occasionally humor is coming across because, you know, history is, we're a funny species. Yes. <laughs> we make some wild decisions. And, um, you know, to be able to, uh, to convey that in all of its emotional complexity was just really, really important to me. Yeah. Um, no, I, 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 I loved that. I felt it so strongly. Um, and I, I was also really interested in those moments in which you are a presence in the book as well. Um, specifically, you know, that like, it's, uh, ice is a cultural history, but it's also a really interesting kind of travelogue. We see you, um, you know, going around to different cities, different archives as you piece together the history of ice. Um, in the conclusion, you're contemplating a journey to Glacier National Park. Um, so I, I wanted to ask you about the travel you did for this book um, and how you thought about incorporating it as part of the narrative. Yeah, well, um, you know, kind of like how I wanted to convey my own surprise. I also wanted to convey a sense of place and where these stories were happening and how those places have changed because of ice um, and other things, you know, for the last 200 years. So, you know, here too, I thought, well, one of the best ways to do that is to describe what I'm seeing and doing it when I'm visiting these different places. Um, and And also because I, I found that the piecing together of ice history is kind of its own story mm. because there's no such thing as a single ice archive, right? Like you can't, you can't just go to a single library and, or, you know, or a special collections, you know, library and say, oh, here is everything you need to know about the history of ice. <laughs> if that existed, there would probably be a lot more books <laughs> like mine. Um, but, you know, the, the story of, of ice is very dispersed and diffuse and involves all kinds of people and places and different types of ingenuity and um uh and you know kind of industrial invention and so i needed to go to places like to to boston and cambridge where Frederick Tudor launched the ice trade. Um, One of my favorite points, uh, places I visited was Apalachicola, Florida, this tiny little town in um, off the Gulf Coast of Florida, where uh, a man named John Gorey invented the first ice making machine. And I wanted to see, you know, like what what he was seeing when he was making this, um, this, this machine. Uh, I went went to New Orleans, which is, um, you know, where, you know, American cocktail culture really took off after Frederick Tudor's ice landed in the city. Um, You know, the bartenders that lived there were just ready for some new element uh, to experiment with in their in their drinks. Um, And, you know, it just it helped me to have the history of ice come alive. And so I wanted that for my readers as well. Mm-hmm. Was there anywhere you were hoping to visit where you didn't get a chance to go? Yeah, unfortunately, a couple of places. Um, and that's largely because I was doing the writing and research of this book right when COVID cast its first shadow mm-hmm. over the United States. You know, I was set to go to Alaska, of all places. I wanted to go to the World Championship, Ice Carving Championship, um, and see that done in person. But you know, there were no, there were, you couldn't fly during the, those first few months. Um, and, and luckily I found out that there was a pretty well-known ice carver that lived just 30 minutes from me. Nice. <laughs> so I tracked him down and he very generously gave me a demonstration of how mm-hmm. he creates his ice sculptures. Um, but so I didn't make it to Alaska. I really wish I could have. Um, I also, uh, 
there were just several archives um, just across the country. There was one in uh, St. Louis, actually, mm-hmm. that had um, materials related to the St. Louis World's Fair, which I talk about in my book, because it was the first World's Fair to have air conditioning and, an, and a large ice plant built in the center of it, um, that I couldn't get to, again, because of COVID. And so, just, you know, thank goodness for librarians. Let me just say that, you know, thank thank you to the Cary Library for hosting this event. And thank you to librarians in general, because during the writing of this book, I actually at one point, you know, was on FaceTime, like on my phone, FaceTime with an archival librarian in St. Louis, who was looking at a piece of, you know, archival material for me. And at one point, she was kind of holding her phone over the document. She's like, do you see what you need to see? I love this. <laughs> because I couldn't be there. And because of the sensitivity of these documents, you know, they really, they they were able to scan some of them. But, you know, in some cases, it's just the integrity of the paper just wouldn't withstand any, any real kind of proper scanning. So, um, so yeah, so I, I mean, yeah, this thank goodness for librarians for making this book possible. I, I dedicated the book to my husband, but I probably should have dedicated it to the librarians of the world. <laughs> um, I, uh, th- there was something about this book that I wanted to connect to a thing that you and I talked about when we were putting together the anthology, um, The World as We Knew It, which I mentioned earlier. Um, so that anthology, um, just for the audience, it dealt with, it focused on um, the individual writer's personal experiences with climate change. So we had writers like Melissa Phoebos and Lydia Millet and Kim Stanley Robinson who were reflecting on the ways they had seen um, the places they knew change um, as a result of the climate crisis. Mm-hmm. Um, and something that, Amy, that you and I talked about a lot was, you know, as we were curating the anthology, we really wanted to create a sense of hope and climate storytelling rather than just like despair, despair, despair. Um, And I feel like that's something that ICE does really beautifully, that even as it's building, you know, building this case for how we got here, how, you know, a lot of deliberate choices of industry um, have been made in service of like of worsening the climate crisis, I feel like, you know, it never loses sight of future possibilities. Um, So I wanted to ask if you could speak about just the role that that played in in writing the book and putting it together. Yeah, well, thank you. Um, I didn't want to write a book that was funny, exciting, you know, filled with colorful historical characters, only to end on a real bummer of a note, (laughs) you know, about how bad, you know, the world is. And and a part of that was, you know, a writerly choice, but that's also just a, a personality choice. You know, I mean, I am, you know, mired in, you know, in climate studies and climate writing, both because of my personal interest and because of my my professional work. Um, and so I know how I know how bad things are and how bad things can get. So I'm not Pollyannish about it by any means. At the same time, I don't find doom and gloom helpful. <laughs> and also, side note, I'm not giving up my eyes. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I like my icy cocktails. I am a clumsy person. I am consistently injuring myself. I need ice to press to swollen ankles and whatever else I'm twisting or hurting that day. So I'm not giving up my ice. And so what I wanted to do, you know, towards the, uh, you know, the end of my research was to, you know, just ask, um, you know, myself in the, in the universe, you know, are there people out there who care about the planet as much as I do? who are taking the role that the cooling industry is playing in the heating of the planet seriously? And are they coming up with some solutions to that? And much to my delight, I learned there are dozens and dozens, maybe hundreds, maybe thousands of people who are taking this very, very seriously. And I spoke to a handful of them um, who, uh, you know, told me that, you know, one of the biggest contributors from the cooling industry, one of the biggest contributors uh, to, uh, to greenhouse gases are household refrigerators and that's because they uh they suck so much energy you know in the average american household the refrigerator is drawing more energy by an order of magnitude than any other appliance and that energy is increased if it has an automatic ice maker because that engine that little motor in your in your ice maker never shuts off that's why you can have ice 
any time, day or night, right? So, um, so that's a problem. And then also, you know, refrigerators, typical refrigerators use, um, you know, conventional, uh, you know, refrigerant gases to, to stay cold. And towards at the end of a refrigerator's life, those gases start to leak and they, uh, you know, then contribute, um, uh, they, they, they contribute themselves to the atmosphere and, uh, and increase the, the greenhouse gas effect. So if that's the case, then the, one of the, the solutions is to not get rid of refrigerators, but to find new types of technology that can replace what we have that's much more energy efficient, energy efficient, that's much just safer for the planet. And there are tons and tons of technologies that are not only being developed, but are currently being scaled up and are going on the market very, very soon at a, you know, at a, at a price point that is competitive with, um, you know, our more conventional, you know, refrigerators that are on the market now. And, um, you know, is that going to change everything? No, of course not. But it's, you know, one pretty remarkable solution um, to, to the problem. And, you know, we live in a, in a, in an era when we need all the solutions we can, all hands on deck. So, you know, I'm, I'm really, I'm really hopeful in, in that regard about what the future of ice looks like. Did you, did you go into the book sort of hoping that there would be a solutions kind of note in it, or is that something that kind of surprised you? Yeah, um, it surprised me. It, the, the amount of work that's already being done in this area surprised me. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it just, you know, just because it's not, it's not well covered, you know, in the, in the journalism space. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, the fact that, you know, I was talking to, you know, engineers and scientists, you know, working at, you know, the most renowned research universities and think tanks in the world, you know, are dedicating their time and resources to this was really heartening to yeah. know that people are, you know, are really trying to make industry wide changes. Why do you think it isn't better known or better reported on? Oh, it's not out of context. It may not be a super sexy story, <laughs> you know, I mean, yeah. the effects, you know, the, the immediate effects of climate change, the damaging effects, the, the wildfires, the sea level rise, you know, these are, these are, these are things that make for pretty sexy headlines and, mm -hmm. you know, talking about, you know, the use of magnets in refrigerators to replace conventional greenhouse gases it's not, it's it's not necessarily the same. It doesn't have the same level of spectacle sure. <laughs> that these other do, yeah. even though they, it is kind of the underpinnings of, you know, social change that is going to make a huge, huge difference, a positive difference in how we all live. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, but I, I hear you. Um, this is why I, you know, I'm calling for the Amy Bradyification of more of climate storytelling to sort of take this longer view rather than just the disaster framing in the news stories. Yeah. 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 I mean, I, um, I like to think that that's changing a bit that, you know, that uh, news outlets are becoming more solutions oriented. Mm. I like to think that's true. Let's, let's, let's see. 2024 is soon upon us. Maybe we'll see those solutions oriented stories. Mm-hmm. Um, to bring it, to bring it back to the book more closely, um, it has this beautiful arc that, you know, traces America's changing relationship to ICE, um, and you, you gestured to this and you said, you know, I'm not, I'm not giving up my ICE, I rely on it too much for, you know, uh, injury and cocktails and honestly, like, relatable, um, but I wanted to ask, how did your sub, your relationship to ICE as a substance change if at all over the course of writing this book oh it totally changed um I mean this is gonna sound funny I and I don't I don't necessarily mean it to be funny but I just I notice it now yeah everywhere and and the reason why that was such a big change is because prior to writing this book I think my relationship with ice was very similar to to most people, you know, in the United States, at least in their relationship with ice, which is that you don't really think about it until you run out, yeah. you know, like, you know, have you ever been, you know, you're, you're at a family get together, you're visiting friends, you're at a camping trip and you run out of ice and it's such a bummer, like then <laughs> you notice it. Right. Yeah. But otherwise it's just something that's just always there. 
And as you know, I was writing this book, you know, I realized that this ubiquitous substance that's just everywhere, first off, there's really nowhere else in the world other than the United States where that's true. Mm-hmm. <laughs> right? I mean, have you ever have you ever sat at a at a cafe in, in Paris and ordered ice in your water? Like you're gonna get a very strange look, <laughs> right? Or if you try to go, you know, to the boulangerie or whatever and order, you know, and try to get a bag of ice, like you're not gonna find it. Yeah. It's a very unique American phenomenon. So that was one of the first things I started thinking about in terms of ice. And then just, you know, this realization that this ubiquitous substance is the culmination of entire industries and robber barons and politicians and in some case celebrities and um you know and entire labor forces that don't exist anymore but at one time was just as common and everywhere as you know the gas station is now today um it's just it's a the fact that we have ice everywhere is now the result of just so much history um, that I just, I had no idea existed until I wrote this book. Yeah. And I really, I like that the book starts with that act of, of noticing, of realization, you know, you're on a road trip, you go to a gas station, you're filling a cup with ice and you're like, Hey, Um, and that, that, you know, that generative impulse really like we keep that, that surprise and fascination with us across the chapters. Um, which brings me to ask, have you had any other moments like that about sort of other aspects of the world that you might consider writing about next? Oh, um, yeah, I mean, I'm, uh, coming back to the self-description of being a very curious and nerdy person. Um, yeah, you know, I mean, I, and I actually hinted this a little bit in, uh, and unwittingly, this was not intentional, but in my last chapter or my epilogue in ICE, you know, I, I talk about this possible road trip and how um, I'm a fan of old maps. Like I, I use a GPS on my phone like everybody, but I also have to have my Rand McNally because yes, they still <laughs> make them. <laughs> I need my Atlas uh, and how I'm just fascinated by maps. And, um, you know, I'm right now, I'm, you know, doing a, uh, a research project to learn learn more about maps and how they're useful, why they may not always be as useful as we think they are. um, And what, what the use of maps can, the history of maps can teach us about ourselves today. I I hadn't, I, you know, you had generously previewed this subject to me, um, but I'd forgotten that it, that it, you know, connects to that, the scene of that last chapter, which is so lovely. Yeah, thanks. Um, once again, I invite people if they have questions to drop them in the chat. Um, but otherwise, Amy and I can just keep chatting. <laughs> that sounds great. <laughs> no, there are there are so many um, you know moments in uh, in my research that I again I tried to convey in this book where um, like I just I had no idea. I had mm. no idea. You know, like that we have them because of ice, you know? So, you know, for example, you know, I, um, I had no idea that we can, uh, link the existence of convenience stores to the ice trade. I was really surprised by that too, to read that. Yeah. Like, I mean, I, I always knew, you know, I, I grew up in, in Kansas, um, you know, in a car, uh, who often needed to stop by, you know, a convenience store to pick up a bag of ice on my way to, you know, visit family or friends or whatnot. Um, but I never really understood the history of the convenience store. And so what was fascinating to me is that the, both the, uh, the history of ice and convenience stores and the convenience store itself originates in the state of Texas. And, um, you know, it began with the Southland Ice Company, where, uh, you know, this this company had several ice depots kind of throughout Dallas and throughout uh, throughout the state um, where people coming you know, to and fro the gas station, excuse me, the grocery store would stop to pick up ice on their way home so that they could restock their their ice box, which, of course, is the precursor to the electric refrigerator. And. Uh, one savvy manager of one of these ice depots noticed that often his 
customers would be grumbling about some kitchen staple that they had forgotten, you know, at the grocery store, like, oh, I wish I'd picked up that gallon of milk or, oh, I wish I bought, you know, that loaf of bread. And so he thought, why not make a few extra dollars by stocking these things alongside the ice? So when people stop to pick up their ice and they realize they've forgotten these things, they can, you know, pick up their milk and their bread too. And so, you know, he, he launched this model. It was hugely successful, you know, so much so that other of the South Ice company, Ice Depots, adopted the model. And those stores became so successful that eventually they had to change their hours of operation to accommodate <laughs> their, um, the, you know, the, all, all the new business. Well, you know, after World War II, when, you know, the ice industry was essentially had become replaced by the electric refrigerating uh, industry, these ice stores needed to rebrand. So they were like, okay, well, we'll still sell ice in bags <laughs> alongside, you know, the bread and the milk. And let's add some, you know, fuel pumps as well to, you know, make sure people can gas up on, when they come and go. And they renamed themselves other, after their operation, other hours of operation. And the 7-Eleven was born. Yeah. And that's, you know, and then of course the 7-Eleven became kind of the prototype of the, uh, the convenience store that we know today. That was such a satisfying reveal in the book. I was like, oh, I see where this is going. Oh my God. <laughs> um, to ask another research question, were there any um, archives that you went to or place or sort of, you know, places where you had to make your own archive where you were, you know, visiting the um, locations of people who history may not have, you know, may not have remembered as vividly um, where um librarians archivists community members were surprised at what you were doing there did that happen at all oh yeah I have to say one of one of the the most surprising well to me it's surprising that they were surprised let me put it that mm, way yeah. was when I actually visited the John Gorey Museum in Apalachicola Florida now, again, John Gorey is the man who invented the mechanical ice machine he was the person who was like you know what I need ice. I live in the South. I can't afford it from the ice trade. I'm going to try to make my own. And he was living in Apalachicola. Uh, he lived there. He died there. He invented his machine there. And today there is a, a one room building called the you know John Gorey Museum. It's really more roadside attraction than John Gorey Museum, even though it's a, technically a part of the state park system. And when uh, on my way there, you know, I stopped at a gas station to get to get some ice, uh, actually. And and when I was um, being rung up, the uh, the clerk, you know, asked me why I was in town. And I said, well, I'm going to go, you know, to the to the John Gordon Museum. And he looked at me and he says, nobody knows. Where are you from? Nobody <laughs> knows about John Gore. He's huge around here, but nobody knows about him. And I explained I'm writing a book about it. He couldn't believe it. Then I get to the John Gore Museum itself. It's locked. <laughs> First off, I think the park ranger there was asleep. <laughs> and when I finally got her to answer the door, she was like, like, you know, it's like, well, I have visitors. Like, what is, what is this? <laughs> and I explained what I was doing and her eyes got the size of saucers. And she's like, let me tell you everything we know about John Gorey. And it, it was a delightful trip. And uh, that, that park ranger's name was Peggy. And she was just a delight in every sense of the word. Um, but uh, but yeah, it's just even even the places that are dedicated to some aspect of the history of ice are amazed when anybody thinks about it, because it is just a substance that nobody has spent a lot of time really appreciating. Mm -hmm. um, we have uh, a question that's that's come in about Frederick Tudor. Um, who plays a very important role in the history of ice in America. Um, can you talk a bit more about his contributions? Yeah, I'd love to. That actually makes perfect sense for any folks tuning in from Massachusetts today. Um, so Frederick Tudor uh, was a wealthy, I will say, a very eccentric Bostonian, um, born a day after the American Revolutionary War ended. And, you know, as I write in my book, you know, he went on to create a revolution of another kind. And that was a revolution in how Americans think of ice. Because, you know, by the time he reached his late teens, early 20s, um, he'd already, you know, tried and failed at many money-making schemes, you know. He came from a wealthy family, but all he wanted to do was make money. He didn't want to get it, go to college. He didn't want a formal education, just wanted to make money. And so he finally landed on the idea, what if I carve large blocks of ice 
out of the lake on my family estate and sell it to warm people living in warm climates at a profit. And, you know, he was like, this is a great idea. All of his peers, including his father, thought he was a madman for even suggesting it. Because, you know, first of all, for people living in Massachusetts, you know, in the 19th century, ice was a common and frankly free substance, <laughs> right? Because it was everywhere. And so they didn't travel far outside of Massachusetts. It wouldn't really occur to them that this was something other people would like. Mm -hmm. But it was also kind of a harebrained idea because nobody had ever tried shipping ice for long distances before. Um, and then as Frederick soon found out, once he figured out how to get ice to the tropics and then to the American South, there was no infrastructure to support the ice. And not only that, but nobody there knew what to do with this stuff because it hadn't occurred to him that to see ice in the early 19th century when you lived in the tip of Florida, would be like seeing a unicorn for the first time. It's just like, wow, you're this beautiful, sparkly thing, but what do I do with you, right? And so Frederick, it took him almost 10 years of ice shipping before he finally convinced people to buy his product. And I love this. This gets back to our love of cocktails, Taja. He eventually he convinced people to buy his ice by showing them how to use ice to make the most delicious things, including cocktails on the rocks and uh, and ice cream. And you know the way he did it is that he demonstrated his cocktail making techniques to bartenders and cafe owners. And he said, look, I know all your customers you know, drink their drinks lukewarm, but I'm gonna give you this ice for free. So you can just test it out. And if they like you know, the drinks uh, on the ice, uh, excuse me, drinks on the rocks more, then you can come back to me and buy more ice. Let's just test it out. And, you know, it's like people in the 19th century, not that different than us in the 21st century. You really can't argue with a drink on the rocks. <laughs> and people love this stuff. And pretty soon bartenders were coming back to uh, Tudor to buy more of the stuff and more of the stuff. And he sold it to them at an increasing, you know, profit. And eventually, you know, became not just a wealthy man, but a very, very wealthy man and launched an entire industry that lasted, you know, 100, 150 years, um, you know, after, after he started it. One thing I love about that, um, about the just the rise of cocktail culture is the the role that the ingenuity of of, of bartenders plays. Um, and it's just it's so wild to think that if they, you know, had they not been presented with this miracle ingredient, like who knows what, you know, the development of drinking culture in, in America might have looked like. Right. Um, right. Yeah. I mean, it's it's really interesting too, because um you know, what I also found out in my book is that, you know, in the early and mid 19th century, when visitors would come to the United States from England, from Europe, they scoffed at what they saw as the lack of American art, right? They were like, who buys an American plate or an American made dress or, mm -hmm. you know, what, what, what American painter of note is there? There's none. And then there's this record of this one, especially snobby, you know, uh, English critic who tastes an American cocktail for the first time. And he goes, ah, <laughs> this is, this is, this is where American art lies. There's nothing like this uh, in England or Europe. And he was right there. There really wasn't. That, that was yeah. a distinctly American innovation. Um, you've touched on this a bit um, with the development of new technology and refrigeration, but um, what role can ICE play as a resource in shaping the future of healthcare and environmental sustainability? So, so many things. So, you know, the, the use of ICE in healthcare goes back centuries, uh, perhaps millennia, right? Um, but in this country, in the United States, it really didn't take hold until the Civil War, which is pretty late you know, in terms of world history. And a lot of that is because, you know, Americans held a rather England, Victorian England view of cold, you know, that, you know, heat to them was just a, a mere nuisance, you know, something that just made life kind of uncomfortable, even though today we know that heat can actually be deadly, you know, if it gets hot enough. But back then it wasn't known to be that way. Cold, however, was thought of as being, um, 
you know, something to avoid at all costs, you know, lest you, you know, you, you catch your death of cold. Right. And so it was, there was a lot of suspicion among doctors. Um, I found these incredible uh, diary entries in my research of civil war doctors who saw soldiers in the, you know, the peak of summer in their wool, you know, uniforms come back from marching and they're just the red faced and they're miserable and they're dizzy and they guzzle, uh, you know, water that, you know, that their commanding officer had put ice cubes in and then they collapse. And then the doctor said, well, it must have been the ice. Oh God. <laughs> right. And not the heat. So, I mean, it's remarkable But the thing about the civil war and I promise I'm going to get to the, the future of healthcare. It's just, I think this history is really important in understanding that future is that during the civil war, it was such a deadly, um, you know, a deadly time with people, you know, dying from wounds, um, but also just from sickness and illness, you know, laying in the barracks and catching infections from, you know, your, your fellow wounded soldiers, it was such a deadly time that doctors were willing to try anything, you know, even if it just made a patient more comfortable. And so they turned to ice as one possibility. And they're like, well, it, you know, we're suspicious of ice, but things really can't get worse. So let's see if it can do anything good. You know, and what they found out is that, you know, it, it helped to lower fevers. Um, you know, it helped in some cases to stave off contagion. It helped to reduce swelling. And it just made patients more comfortable. And so suddenly the, the you know, psychology, the thinking around ice changed. And they're like, well, what else can ice do? And then we enter into this period of, um, you know, of experimentation. And all that has led to uh, today's era of experimentation where, you know, many, you know, world-class hospitals and, and, you know, even maybe some not world-class hospitals, you know, are using um, therapies such as, you know, um, you know, therapeutic hypothermia, which is the process of lowering a patient's body temperature, um, you know, to, to a almost dangerously low temperature to help preserve their, their organs after a catastrophic event, you know, like cardiac arrest or a, or a head injury. Um, also, I was delighted to learn more about the uses of cryotherapy, which mm -hmm. is a, a, a therapy that involves injecting ice crystals into the body to either, you know, to do everything from correct uh, coloring on a, you know, on the skin to actually treating cancerous tumors. Um, and there are um, some incredible doctors right now who are experimenting uh, with cryotherapy uh, in breast cancer specifically and are trying to bring that therapy to um, you know to underserved places around the world where it could it could be life-saving in some cases um, and yeah I mean it's and it's all because you know of ice and because of the, the change in thinking um, around how ice can be beneficial so that was that was also a hopeful aspect <laughs> of my research. Yeah, and then in terms of environmental sustainability, I mean, a, a lot of it um, comes down to the, the new technologies that are happening in the cooling industry. I talked about refrigerators, but you know, also air air conditioning technology is changing dramatically. Um, I am the uh, my husband and I are the new owners of a heat pump system which cools the house much more efficiently and much quicker than um, any of our, our previous systems. And they are much, much, much more energy efficient and safer for the environment. Um, I wanna ask about the, the experiential part of the book, because you know, we see you travel, we see, we see you research, we also see you, um, you know, participate in ice activities. Um, we see you go curling. <laughs> um, how did you, uh, how did you approach that aspect of the book? Decide, you know, this is this is something I'm going to try, but also this is something I'm going to show myself doing. Yeah, well, you know, again, in the in the desire to entertain, I thought, well, what could be more entertaining than you know watching your guide through ice history um, fail miserably at things like curling. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's it's that in that instance in particular. You know, I have to say. Like so many people, I loved watching the the curling matches during the Winter Olympics. I, I'm pro curling. Like I just, I think it's a delightful sport to watch. I also thought, because I'm an incredibly naive person, 
that of all the Olympic sports, <laughs> curling is probably the one I could do. Because it, it, it looks like a bunch of sweeping and bowling <laughs> on ice. I'm not a great bowler, but I can do it. <laughs> right. And I thought I can do that. So, and, you know, in learning more about curling and, and side note, you know, I wanted to include curling in my book because it is a sport that is played on a very strange sheet of ice. The type of, of pebbled ice that curlers use is unlike anything else. It's very, very unusual. And so I went to my local curling club and I was like, look, never done this, um, but I'm really keen to try. And they were very kind, very generous and laughed extremely hard <laughs> when in for the first hour, every attempt I made to, to throw that, it's called the stone down the sheet of ice uh, in curling. Um, I, I fell and made a complete fool of myself. But it was a lot of fun. And now I have mad, mad respect for curling athletes. I am so sorry I ever compared you to bowlers. <laughs> or sweepers. Or sweepers. <laughs> um, we have a question uh, in the Q&A box. Um, is there any, any anything significant in the history of dry ice? Was that something that at all came up in your research? Oh, that's so interesting. Well, you know, I didn't talk a whole lot about uh, dry ice in my book, you know, largely because, um, you know, I wanted to, uh, oh, again, you know, book can only be so long. And, you know, what I wanted to do was kind of to focus specifically on, you know, the, the connection between, you know, harvesting water, frozen water out of a lake and where that brought us today. And the thing about dry ice is that it's, it's, actually not frozen water it's a completely different substance um but but it is a completely different substance that you know has gained um a, a, a large following from people in a lot of different types of industries because it is such a useful way of getting things really really cold and so what i actually found really interesting in my research is that um for the people that still sell ice today you know ice and ice is being sold in all different types. Of, we don't have ice depots anymore, right? But we actually still do have, you know, places that sell um, ice, not just in bags, but in big blocks of ice for ice sculptures or for restaurants who need to buy it. Um, where I am in Connecticut, um, there are several of these types of, of uh, places, you know, within driving distance of me. And I imagine that's, that's true in Massachusetts as well. Um, so for these people, they, in just the last 10 years, have also started selling dry ice. And, um, you know, it, it's just, it's just another way in which, you know, the ice industry is reinventing itself and finding new clients and new industries to get into by selling new and exciting products. Do you have any specific darlings that you, you know, you had to trim from the book that were especially hard to let go of any kind of really fascinating like nuggets or subplots or, um, things where it was like, I would love to keep this, but book can't be that long. Yeah. Yeah. In my case, it was because the book can't be that long. And also because the history of ice in some cases is so ephemeral, you know, to mm -hmm. use an ice metaphor, it just kind of melted away without any <laughs> official record. And so, you know, trying to be the, you know, the proper reliable historian that I want to be, I didn't want to include anything that I couldn't, uh, you know, effectively support you know, with mm -hmm. historical evidence. And one of the stories that I really wanted to include, but I just never could quite nail it down, is the um, story about the uh, the original owner of the Anheuser-Busch Brewery. Oh. And, and this, is, this is such a fascinating story because, you know, that brewery, um, like so many Midwestern American breweries, um, got their start brewing lager, which is a type of beer that can only be brewed and stored at cold temperatures. And so, um, you know, after the launch of the ice trade, these breweries cropped up because they suddenly had access to, to all kinds of ice uh, being shipped, um, you know, from the north, you know, as well as the invention of mechanical ice. So there were, you know, we're brewing, um, you know, beer in, in large quantities. So uh, legend has it <laughs> that the original owner of this, uh, of the Anheuser-Busch uh, brewery was not only, you know, a big fan of beer, but a big fan of ice. And when he built his big, original big mansion, which is no longer standing, um, that he had 
a kind of like a trough or maybe even a, we might call it a moat dug around the outside of the foundation of his house so that after the trains delivering the ice to the brewery emptied out their stock, what was left could then be brought by railroad because he also, rumor has it, had the, the, the railroad extended to his house. Oh my God. His house, so the ice could be dumped in this moat to try to create this like cooling effect mm. for the house. And I thought, this is such a great story because first off, it's like a wild way to use your riches, <laughs> right? There are so many things you could do. What, you know, why are you building a moat around your house filled with ice? <laughs> but for me, it also just illustrates a fundamental misunderstanding of what ice is and how cold works, because that's not really going to cool down your house. It is, however, and I know this as somebody who has a very wet basement, it's going to do a lot of damage oh, no. <laughs> to your foundation. <laughs> and I, I wonder if maybe in retrospect, the evidence that I needed to, to really nail down this story is the fact that that house is no longer standing. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's wild. Do we have any other last lingering questions from the audience? Okay. Okay, then. Well, uh, thank you, Amy and Taja, for a fascinating conversation. We've learned so much tonight. Um, grab the book either from the library or purchase it from Porter Square Books. Um, thank you. Thank you everyone for joining us tonight. And thank you again, Amy and Taja. I look forward to seeing what you both will do next. Thank you, thank so, you much. so much for having us. Thank you, Taja. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good night, everyone.